So therapy, important to understand the sources of things, important to connect. And then some kinds of couples therapy or parent adult child therapy might work on coping strategies like how can we communicate better and mm -hmm. that's all fine. What the workshop's designed to do is to radically transform your view of the relationship itself. And if you would get in touch with what's possible, you get even a taste of it, you're like, oh, I prefer that. If that's possible, so what is that? Well, peace, understanding, some end to a gut-wrenching or mind-numbing dynamic that you just know is going to happen every time. Well, how lovely would it be like to have one Thanksgiving or, or one family visit that doesn't go as planned? The problem is, is that it's too predictable. We know what's going to happen. You know when you call your parents up how that conversation is going to go. It's a script. The Hello Again workshop is designed to, you could say, flip the script. Yeah. But first we have to read the script and be like, oh, what script are we acting out? Yeah. So it's like that. It's more, it's more punchy. And that's my style. Welcome, Daniel, um, to Third Culture Therapy, a podcast that sits at the intersection of mental health and culture, where we're going to be talking about mental and emotional well-being and how it relates to society, culture, our backgrounds. Daniel Mate is a composer, a lyricist, and a playwright for musical theater. Um, he's also the co-author of the super best-selling book that's also on my bookshelf, uh, The Myth of Normal, along with his father, the renowned physician and speaker, Dr. Gabor Mate. Uh, Daniel was born and raised in a Jewish household in Vancouver to his Canadian-born mother and his Hungarian-born father currently lives in New York, in Brooklyn, in New York. Daniel studied psychology and philosophy at McGill and later um, graduated from New York University's Tisch School of the Arts with an MFA in musical theater. Daniel has received many prestigious awards. Daniel has presented his work at the Historic Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. and New York Lincoln Center. Daniel runs a mental chiropractic service called Take a Walk with Daniel, which I was very uh, privileged to just literally experience right now. And we'll talk about that. Um, and he's in the process of co-authoring co another book with uh, his father, Dr. Gabor, um, called in Hello Again, A Fresh Start for Parents and Their Adult Children, which is the name of the popular workshop of the same title, which uh, you and your father uh, co-run together, yeah. co-host together. Yeah. Um, more recently, uh, more specifically since October 7th, um, and all the horrors that have happened in Israel-Palestine since, as especially in, in Gaza, Daniel has become uh, something of an online activist on Palestine, I would say. We call you an online activist. This is um, Daniel for our listeners, and thank you very much for joining in this in this conversation with me. And on that note, my question, my first question to you, and this question I normally ask all my guests to begin with is, obviously I listed many identifying features um, in your intro, including culturally, but not specifically. And my question to you is, which of these characteristics do you most closely identify with? That's a good question, and I'm not convinced that I can answer it honestly. Mm -hmm. But yet, it's inevitable that we have identities. I don't identify particularly as a man, although I am one. Like, that's my relationship to my sex and gender. I'm, I'm inescapably one, and I, I, I am comfortable enough with it that I can use the language. Jewishness is the same thing. There's parts of being Jewish that resonate for me. I think that's what I would say. There's parts mm -hmm. of my various components that resonate strongly and others that don't. And I could go down the line, you know, uh, bourgeois middle class, yeah. educated, mm -hmm. living in, you know, Canadian, Canadian who lives in New York. All of these things have upsides and downsides. And some of them, in each of them, parts of it feel like me and parts of it don't feel like me and and so I um I mean I think ultimately for better or worse the identity to which I cling the most is like my Danielness like my mm -hmm. individuality mm -hmm. on the Enneagram which yeah. is a personality model that I I quite like it's quite sophisticated um I strongly identify or I I I, I locate myself on that as a four which is the individualist yeah who, who is kind of <clears throat> 
very hyper attuned to and at some levels of it fixated on or obsessed with to a to a detrimental degree mm. his or her individuality i'm different than everybody now that i absolutely identify with daniel you studied psychology as an undergraduate at mcgill mm. and then you um pursued a career in musical theater what made you make that big shift so psychology well it was a default option mm -hmm. and it's kind of a, a sad funny story it's just so many sad funny stories in my life so many mishaps that turned out to be crucial mm -hmm. maybe crucial mishaps will be the name of my memoir um i did the international baccalaureate program in high school oh me too did you yeah what was your extended essay on oh god what was my extended essay on i, mean, no, I can't remember anymore Mine, wow, that's bad. Mine was on U.S. attitudes towards Zionism before 1948. Interesting. So Good at, one. Looking at the State Department's ambivalence up to a certain point. And, yeah. yeah. I, I feel like my extended essay must have been on something Israel-Palestine, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got, I think I got like a plus two on my extended essay, which is like the highest you could get. And I, I had like the second highest or maybe even the highest test scores in my whole class. And I did not study the hardest. You know, wow. it just played to my strengths. Wow because it was interactive and it was engaging yeah. and it was higher level as a reward for that i got full credit for a full year of university at mcgill right essentially like a, a year and lopped off the top amazing well amazing wow. but disastrous because <clears throat> first of all i didn't know what undergraduate was for i didn't i didn't i kind of wanted to st keep stay in high school yeah i wasn't i didn't come from a family where university achievement was particularly important. It's not like we were like a working class family, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to be a doctor, right. you know? Now you have to remember that, or not remember, keep in mind that at this point when I was choosing where to go for university, it was 1993, my father was not a therapist. Right. In fact, he would never be mistaken for a psychologist or psychiatrist as he sometimes is now. Um, and yet the culture of my family was very much about why are people the way they are? Okay. And how can we get, how can we improve ourselves? All right. So around age 10 or 11, my parents, especially my dad, started explaining to me that my troubles on the schoolyard were a function of early childhood trauma. This was not a helpful thing to take to school the next day. Yeah. This did not empower me to mm -hmm. make better friends or be more chill. It made sure. me much more self. So in other words, a kind of self-absorbed fixation took over and a hyper-awareness of my pain and an inability to escape it, and a, but also, positively speaking, a desire to understand myself. Yeah. So, couple that with, I don't really have a sense of why I go to university. I knew I was going to take a year off to actually go live in Israel on my Jewish youth group's year-long kibbutz program, which is a whole other topic we can talk about. <laughs> okay. But I was always planning to do it because that's what my friends were going to do, and I, right. th that was an important friend group to me. Not because I was a fervent Zionist, but because it sounded fun. Mm. Um, and uh, meanwhile, everyone's applying to universities. Which one are you going to go to? I'm applying to the. I applied to two universities. One I didn't hear back from. The other one was McGill. Right. Montreal sounded fun. Mm -hmm. And McGill gives me a full year off. I take it because I love being advanced. I love being special. Yeah. Right. I get to Montreal. And because I've skipped my freshman year, I don't have to do a cert. I can, in fact, I'm kind of induced to declare my major right away. Right. And the next day, I wa walk my ass down to the psychology department, go up to the seventh floor, and declare my major. And I speak to the, you know, the head of the department, and I say I'd like to be in the... And so he says, okay, you need to take this many psychology courses. So from the beginning, I'm taking, like, all psychology courses. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm doing fine in it, and then I decide to up the challenge by entering the honors program in second year. Right. But what I'm not really clocking is that I'm not enjoying it. Yeah. I'm excelling, mm -hmm. but it's kind of just an intellectual exercise because what I'm not getting is any kind of humanistic education. Sure. I'm not learning any more about why I am the way I am. In mm. fact, Freud isn't mentioned until the third year when you take a course on personality and then he's mentioned derisively like oh he wasn't empirical enough at a certain point I decided I'd like to kind of humanize my education a bit and do a double major so I went again to the same uh, head of the department and said I'd like to do a double major in psychology and philosophy yeah 
because I'd noticed that in the philosophy department, they had a graduate level seminar on psychoanalysis. I'm like, well, there it is. Okay, right. great. Finally, like I want to learn about this stuff, right? Yeah. The, the head of the department, I'll never forget this, looks at me and says, uh, you can't do that. You can't do a double major in psychology and philosophy. I said, why not? He said, because philosophy is not an empirical science. But he said, you can do a double major in psychology and economics. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started to clue in that this is not what I thought it was. This is training us and grooming us to be loyal servants of empire, of industry, and of mm -hmm. profit. It's about predicting and controlling human behavior, not about understanding it or explaining it. And, and, and it's certainly not coming from a place of much um, curiosity about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And yet I was so deep in, and I was so proud of how far I'd gotten, and I identified as an advanced student. Now, meanwhile, to keep myself sane, I was doing music and I was doing theater. Mm -hmm. So, fast forwarding, because you asked me a very simple question, which I'm giving you a very <laughs> elaborate answer for. I dropped out in fourth year. I crashed. I had a nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. And I went to the, you know, the, the administrative department and it was humiliated. I had to prove that I was depressed. And I couldn't get out of bed, you know. And this was the start of a, 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 an adulthood full of these episodes of, of big ups and big downs. And it was only around age 28 or 29 that I faced, oh my God, I've been stuck inside of a story that all education is doomed for me. That like, there's no school, there's no program, there's no discipline that can fit me. I'm too good. I'm not good enough. And I've been scared. I've just been scared to take that risk. I've been scared to not be the smartest person in the room. And I've been focusing entirely on my own internal process and not, okay, sure, I can name all the things that are wrong with me, but what's right with me? Yeah. And what do I want to share with the world? And it took my mom saying to me, I can't believe that someone with your talent, and I've got perfect pitch, really skilled with words, like, I can't believe that someone like you wouldn't want to do it professionally in some way. That's when I opened myself to the possibility of grad school. Very quickly, I found the NYU program, musical theater writing didn't seem obvious to me, but it was obvious to everyone who knew me. Yeah, I went in taking the risk that I wouldn't be the smartest person in the room, and I wasn't. I wasn't by far, far the most knowledgeable about this stuff, and I had to learn, and I did, and it was great, and I learned to collaborate and, and all of that. So the whole trajectory of my education is sort of a little microcosm of my tortured but <laughs> but ultimately well well faded yeah um struggle to become myself were you um in therapy or seeking any sort of external uh help and i would occasionally go see whatever therapist my parents happened to be seeing it. yeah i was gonna say not your parents okay yeah, <laughs> you know and one therapist one therapist actually said to me in fact their therapist said to me your parents really did a number on you by, <laughs> by revealing to you all the ways in which they messed you up. Mm. They messed you up further yeah. because they got you on their side and they kind of, you know, the term gaslighting wasn't in use back then and probably it's not accurate, but they sort of uh, defanged your own That's emergent nice. anger nice. or your own, yeah. your, your, your individuation, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're confused as to who you are and you're mm -hmm. filled and the anger is introjected and so depression is there, all this kind of stuff, yeah. which just made me more pissed off and it just it didn't live even that knowledge didn't liberate me i've had frustration when i noticed that tendency in my family but of course i'm only frustrated with them to the extent that i can't escape that dynamic myself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um yeah like there can be a there can be a trauma vortex a healing vortex you know we, we start to become so aware of where our stuff comes from but nothing mm -hmm. impels it forward and and i always felt a certain degree of you know, dissatisfaction with that. But I, until my late twenties and in my t late twenties, I encountered a, a different modality, which was a series of personal development courses that mm. first my father took mm -hmm. at a particular moment of crisis. And, um, it seemed to really, it was the first thing I'd ever seen that actually shifted his behavior, oh. his attitude, his What outlook. Kind of self -development course it's called landmark, okay. which is kind of notorious for being culty. Mm -hmm. They're not actually a cult. They're just a corporation with a obnoxious uh marketing approach which is very word of mouth tell your family tell your friends and there's a lot of internal like focus on that and i became a zealot like i was really a... that said it was a very good product okay. it was an extremely um powerful set of courses that 
for the first time in my life, outsmarted me. Mm. It outsmarted my smarts because my smarts didn't matter anymore. They would always say knowledge is the booby prize. Understanding is the booby prize. It's the consolation prize. Like what you want is transformation, a shift in experience. And I was there in the room trying to figure everything out and being smarter than everyone. There was one point in the first seminar, the first course of theirs, where the course leader's talking about something or other about the human condition. And he says, now who, you know, who wants to share? What is this bringing up for you? What is this, you know, what are you hearing in this conversation? And I put up my hand and I said, well, you know, it's really bringing to mind that, uh, that, that, that soliloquy from Macbeth, you know, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day. Life is, you know, man is a shadow or whatever, I forget it, <laughs> strutting and fretting his hour upon the stage. And, and the guy says, have you been looking at my notes? Have you ever done this course before? I said, no. He says, literally on the next page, that's part of the, the oh, curriculum of the God. thing. And everyone around me is like, oh, smell you. Like, yeah. like, 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 oh, you're, you're like, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and yet everyone around me is having transformations and I'm not. not yeah. I'm getting insights. I'm having thoughts. I'm pissed off. I'm whatever. I'm different, but I'm no different than I was when I walked in. Yeah. And... What was great about that course is it did not let me wriggle out of that. It did not let my mm. smarts win the day. And it had made me sit with the wrenching impact of living that way, the deep frustration and anger yeah. and loneliness of that. And by the end of the course, I was having a tantrum. And it was in the middle of the tantrum that something clicked and that I can either be right about the story that gives me an identity that I can predict and understand or I can be open to possibility. Which do I actually want? And it became optional for us. For, all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, my experience had some flex to it. It, had, yeah. it, was, it was malleable. So that was extremely liberating. So of course I got very excited about this work and I started, you know, I got very into it and it made a lot of, in fact, that was the precursor to me finding NYU and being even open to my mom's, mm. what in the past would have sounded like critique. So yeah. something shifted where I got that I had some choice in the matter of who I'm going to be in life, never mind what's happening to me or what's happening. Now, did that instantly turn me into a fully responsible adult who doesn't blame his parents and doesn't, uh, isn't self-absorbed? Absolutely not. But it challenged. What was after the healing journey for you from there? Because I understand that point. And I do recall as well myself those moments initial moments of like aha and then you know for 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 a little minute you think oh, okay i'm good now yep. and then you realize that actually you have another 10 20 50 years ahead of you of yeah. just keeping doing this in different variations and sure. permutations and it's layers and yep. layers and you think you understood one thing but actually then there's another thing and That's you right. think you feel and it can be very frustrating um and um have its own sadness to it because we we still are operating within this like productively minded society that wants to feel like we're progressing so whenever you feel like you're going backwards it it it, it hurts even more because you've committed to this healing journey or at least has been my experience i'm i'm Judging from the nodding that you're like, yes, I understand that. Yeah, well, it seems like we're going around in a circle. What yeah. we don't see is we're, dis we're either ascending or descending a spiral staircase. Yeah. So there's depth to it, actually. There's a third dimension, but it doesn't feel that way because we never get where we're going. Yeah, yeah. So what was the healing journey? Well, yeah, I had to indulge in the like um, self-satisfaction of, oh, I cracked the code. I'm transformed now. And everyone around me should be transformed too. It's so simple, you know. Never mind the fact that like, my behavior contradicts that and that I'm still getting depressed and um, things like that. But, but at least I had more tools, mm -hmm. you know, and I just had to enjoy the benefits of that. A lot of aspects of my life kind of opened up that had been dormant. Cool. Well, certainly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in my 30s, all of a sudden, ha being, having professional training mm. in writing musicals and collaborating with others, that was mm. huge for me. That got me out of my loneliness story. But I, I, I made a... Um, a solo album when I was 25 and it's called Through These Parts Alone and the cover is me sitting cross-legged in a field like, I don't know, 50 meters away from the camera in this grassy field. You can barely see me all by myself. <laughs> Fast yeah. forward to my 30s where I'm like putting, it's not about me anymore. I'm writing characters. I'm putting these kinds of crazy neuroses and strivings and foibles and, and, and giving it to actors who can really sing and 
Um, I loved that. And it was, that was very, in some ways, healing for me. And the word healing just means a movement towards wholeness. Well, I, I got back to where I once belonged, to quote the Beatles. You know, I, I, I loved writing songs when I was a kid. And I loved playing with others. And so that, I, I repatriated to myself. I recovered mm -hmm. that part of me. That was great. And that wasn't all of it. And I think that what I've never, well, I've never, I've never quite thought of it this way until now, but I would say that the, the step after experiencing a transformative aha, which gave me a new reference point of what's possible, and then being, you know, tossed back out of the garden, back into, you know, the mundane hell of being human, was taking an inventory of what it was that I was still carrying. I had a line in a song back on that album where I said, you were my disease and I won't let you be the cure. Well, I sure did let them be the cure because yeah. it was more convenient than, than risking... You know, loss, and, the loss of them, right? The, the loss the of rupture them, but of... also the, the rupture of that, but also the responsibility of being out on my own. And I, 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 yeah. I mean, out of my own psychologically, stepping out and, and having to own. It's comfy to have parents who are guilty. Yeah. It's yeah. comfy. It's kind of a racket. You can keep deriving, you know, and, and it, but it just keeps it going. And it's not compassionate towards me. It's not compassionate towards them. And I get to sort of trade in my resentment and my grievances and my struggle for more and more indulgence, which at, by the time you reach 40 is just wearing away. It's eroding your sense of self-esteem. Am I something other than Gabor Mate's son? Mm. Am I something other than childhood trauma that needs to be constantly tended to. Mm. Who am I really? So when you are having this kind of aha moment and this revelation of like, wait a minute, my parents did fuck me up. And at that point, when you are getting there is also coinciding with the time when your father is becoming incredibly popular and yeah. renowned as a sort of, as a, as a healer of sorts. So right? here I am expanding and he's <laughs> keeping pace with me. In fact, like yeah, he, also, his shadow is getting bigger and but bigger. It's also be making it harder, I'm assuming, for you to, to go through the necessary angry phases that like I've been through when you, when you're doing real healing work on yourself and it's inevitable, you're going to like find your parents and they're going to be demons for a while in a way they have to be like, it's, it's a necessary process. I think part of the reason why I probably was limited for a while was because I really didn't want to, I didn't want to make them enemies. I could, I had a lot of compassion for them. And so, but what I realized I was bypassing a point that was just, it was a necessary step. It was an absolutely necessary step. I'm just imagining from your case, it gets additionally complicated when like the world at large is all like, oh, what this, what an incredibly enlightened man this is who's wow. writing these books. And you're meanwhile being like, I really need to be angry with this person. Yeah, but here's where my temperament as an individualist, as a kind of... Uh, you, you know, uh, an outlier or whatever, or uh, non-conformist, it helped. Yeah. Because number one, I just realized, okay, great, my dad can heal the world, he can't heal me, his, I'm, I'm inured to his methods, mm -hmm. I see right through them, mm. which actually made me the ideal collaborator for him. Mm. Because, Interesting. as I had learned in collaboration in the musical theater world, you gotta bring something the other person can't bring, you gotta lose, right. bring a different dimension yeah. to it. Mm -hmm. And as we worked that, first on the Hello Again project and then on the writing of The Myth of Normal and now on the writing of the Hello Again book, I started to see my value as very distinct from him coming from my difference. I mean, his public profile got so big that it was a little bit like, well, I can't, I, I can't compete with that no. and, I, and I don't need to. Mm. Did it bother you though, in a sense, as a, on a basic like father-son uh, relationship, like were you bothered that perhaps at a time when you just wanted your dad to be your dad, he was out being like the world's dad? Well, that wasn't new. Yeah. He was being the world's savior when I was a kid right. for his patients. And he yeah. was a workaholic back then. I only recently said to him, dad, I just want a dad. And it was right before he turned 80 wow. a few months ago. And we had just finished doing the Hello Again workshop for mm -hmm. like the, I don't know, 10th time. We did it in Topanga, California, and it was filmed. It's going to come out as a little documentary and as an online course. And it had gone extremely well. And by the end of it, I was irritated, pissed off, and exhausted, the same way I always am. 
it took something out of me. Mm. And it takes things out of me that it does not take out of him mm. because I'm reliving my childhood up there. Mm. And that's more traumatic than reliving your parenting. And even if we're doing a good job, it's also incumbent upon me in that workshop to turn every little friction into a teachable moment for others. Yeah. Which means I don't get to fully feel it, which means there's a backlash afterwards. Right. And I actually said to him afterwards, I said, we died, we don't have to do this anymore, and I don't want to. Mm. We're going to write this book. The online web course is going to be out there. It'll be like pff, vaporized, yeah. diffused. I just want a dad. Yeah. You're turning 80. You know, I'm actually tired of this collaboration. Not because there's anything wrong with it. Sure. Because we've accom- we, mission accomplished. Yeah. We did it. And I've come to really understand who I am, both in ways that are connected to you and separate from you. Not in opposition to you, yeah. but in contrast to you, let's say. Mm-hmm. What is the premise of Hello Again, maybe? And what, how did it like develop? And what mm-hmm. is it that you're all, you know, teaching? Like- yeah, well, so first of all, they could come as a pair. You know, parents, adult children together or a trio. Or they could come alone. Actually, it doesn't matter because it's not a relationship course. It's a course about your relationship to the relationship. Mm-hmm. And even if you're estranged, you have a relationship to the estrangement. And even if the parents or the, even the children are dead or, you know, demented or addicted or, you know, what I'm saying, to the point where they're just, you can't work on the relationship together, you have a relationship to the relationship. Mm-hmm. And um, that's what people are there to work on. So, you know, we start from the basic dilemma of the thing, which is that the relationship, I mean, it's the, which is why is this relationship different from all other relationships? It's fundamentally different. And I'm now I'm talking about the relationship between parents and adult kids. Mm. When these two people met, one person was a sentient adult being that in some, on some level chose to enter into a relationship with, the junior being in the relationship. The junior being never consented to be in that relationship. In fact, never asked to exist. They weren't around when the decision was made. Sure. They couldn't co-sign it at all. One, <laughs> one party has bowel control, the other doesn't. And not just that, but responsibility is completely lopsided. And the other is completely dependent. And it's not just that they're dependent temporarily and then whatever happens, happens. No, what happens during the dependent period is extremely consequential. In fact, it's the primary influence on who that person will become when they are the adult who can have the relationship with the parent. And there's a reason, I think, that if you go into any bookstore, go to the parenting section, shelves upon shelves of, you know, how to raise your kid from zygote to college graduate, virtually nothing about the relationship between parents and adult kids, except for sort of books on like what to do with your borderline personality Mm. kid or your Mm. narcissistic parents, like kind of troubleshooting what really goes wrong. Mm. or, or, But what about the rest of us? And what about the intervening decades between childhood and saying goodbye in whatever configuration? Mm. There's nothing on it. So we start with that dilemma. How are you supposed to have any, anything like equality or symmetry or any, like, and what is even the appropriate desirable outcome? Should we remain subservient to our parents? And is that what honoring our parents is? And what does that even mean? So we start from there. And then we start to map the territory of kind of how these things play out. And you start to, I think, hopefully see yourself in some of the prototypes and paradigms and, 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 and patterns that we're describing, which will allow you to see, oh, okay, I'm falling in, this is a default thing that I do to cope with this relationship, and what is it concealing? The parents get to take an inventory of what they're carrying. Is it guilt, shame, resentment? Are they projecting their unhealed childhood wounds onto their kids? What's the impact been on their kids? So basically, getting into a relationship for the parents into, who am I in a relationship with? What is this child carrying? And you have to face the fact as a parent that your child is carrying that as a consequence of their experience with you. It doesn't mean it's your fault. Right. So parents learn, I think, to see their kids more as fully, uh, as their own people, but also to understand what the child may be struggling with in updating the relationship with that parent. 
So whose idea was Hello Again? Um, it was actually mine. It was, okay. Yeah. I named it and, and someone came to us and said, I'd like to get the two of you on stage together. I think that would be dynamite. Mm. No, you, have, you two on stage together are great. I did watch, um, and I would encourage people to watch the tw- 2016. It is on the Hello Again website. And you have a great dynamic. Um, that was a tough one. I mean, but it was tough. And I could feel it, you know. I could feel so much of things being worked out still but there was there was such I was just struck by how um much compassion and also how much there was was present and how much ego was removed I know with effort of course but that it was still piece by piece yeah in the moment in the moment yeah because it's like we were two guys who 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 loved each other very much who were struggling to like each other yeah we had had a huge fight in the car on the, way down. the parking lot. <laughs> and then on stage in the middle of the Q&A, my dad basically passive aggressively tells me I'm talking too much. <laughs> and I call him out on it. Yeah. And I kind of turn to the audience. And in, in a sense, it's like my childhood fantasy come true. If I could have told 10 year old me at the dinner table that someday there'll be people in the bleachers around the dinner table observing this dynamic, you won't be alone. I can say, did anyone just see what I saw? Yeah. I would have been like, fuck yeah, I'll wait for that. That's yeah. great. But then you also immediately after you, you got that, it's like you got that and there was a momentary relief, but then something else kicked in and you were like, no, that's not actually what was happening. Because you said something along the lines of, oh, well, my father just undermined me in front of like 200 people. And it was like, I could sense there was a sense of relief when you said it, but then immediately after there was this like awareness of, okay, no, I know that's not what's actually Well, because it ultimately doesn't, it feels good in the moment. Yeah. It's kind of an overcorrection. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, famous guy. Yeah, let me tell you could, a thing or two. Two can play this game. <laughs> and th- you've never had this happen before too. You've always been the one in control on stage by yourself, expert and rightly revered for your work. But so, you know, you guess, guess what? Your son's on stage with you now. And you're going to share this stage. Yeah, the egos, our egos flared up. Mine certainly did. But this is where having an intention helps because we knew what we were there to provide for people and we were inspired by that. We, you know, we call it a fresh start for parents and their adult children, not a happy ending. Yeah. And there would, there would have been nothing fresh about me just winning that, like, a, like some kind of YouTube yeah. debate. Uh, the fresh thing would have been and was, I think, moving through it, not resisting it, not pretending it's not there. And I think that's been our credo. That's been our way of working together. And yeah. that's been very, very healing because it keeps us honest. Mm-hmm. It also keeps us from indulging in our shit for too long because it's not about us. We're there for others. Yeah. But we get to reap the benefits. So how does a workshop like yours um, compare to going to therapy with your adult child or with your parent it's quicker Mm. um it doesn't require that you go to therapy with them (laughs) you can come alone like i said okay i mean this is where my mental chiropractic work comes in because Mm -hmm. even before i had a name for it i think the style and the the tone of hello again is is it's very influenced by it because it's, it's a joint collaboration. So my dad brings his work into it, but he'll say at the beginning of every workshop, this is not a Gabor workshop. Of all the topics I lecture on, this is the one I'm the least sure about. And this is very much a collaboration. And my approach, you know, I take for granted that we're all traumatized. Mm. I just take it as a given. We're all carrying emotional injuries. And I, I'm not being flip about it. Yeah. My question is, what now? And that question comes down to, what's your intention? Well, my intention is to heal. Okay, why do you want to heal? Mm. What's the healing for? Mm-hmm. Well, so I can be better. Now, now you're getting into self-improvement and a vortex where you'll just never get enough. Because there'll always be something else. But if you have your, eye, if you have your eyes on some kind of worthwhile prize then you can actually enjoy the fruits of the healing while you're doing it. The reason this relationship is so hard to work on and um, so elusive to work on, but also why it's so little worked on, like I said, there's no books on it, is that it's fine. Like, you don't need each other in the same way. 
Right. Even if it sucks, it's fine. Fine. You see them at Christmas. Yeah. You see them for family events or you don't see them at all. Either way, nothing's riding on it except a sense of completion yeah. and you can cope with it being incomplete. It's fine. And not so, all families are like your families that are so intertwined and meshed right. such that in a way you were forced. There was a desire, clearly. There's obviously clearly a desire for you all to be together. You're very much a close-knit family. That's right. And we also, but, I, I think, got bored of the same old dynamics. Yeah. There's a kind of like impatience, like, okay, what now? Yeah. I think, so therapy, important to understand the sources of things, important to connect. And then some kinds of couples therapy or parent adult child therapy might work on coping strategies, like how can we communicate better? And mm -hmm. how can we, you know, that's all fine. What the workshop's designed to do is to radically transform your view of the relationship itself. And if you would get in touch with what's possible, you get even a taste of it, you're like, oh, I prefer that. If that's possible, so what is that? Well, I don't know. Peace, understanding, some end to a gut-wrenching or mind-numbing dynamic that you just know is going to happen every time. Well, how lovely would it be like, to have one Thanksgiving or, or one family visit that doesn't go as planned? Mm. The problem is, is that it's too predictable. We know what's going to happen. You know when you call your parents up how that conversation is going to go. It's a script. The Hello Again workshop is designed to, you could say, flip the script. Yeah. But first we have to read the script and be like, oh, what script are we acting out? Yeah. So it's like that. It's more, it's more punchy, you know, right. it, 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 and that's my style. How did you get to this? How did you develop it and um, why? Well, I was very impressed by what I saw in those transformational workshops in my late 20s and 30s. I was very impressed by the ruthlessly compassionate coaching method of these leaders where people are coming in complaining about something, saying they want to change it, and then it's easy to demonstrate how little they actually want to change it, which is to say demonstrating all the things that get in the way of actually changing it because some part of them really does. Being in a space where it's about not about changing anything, but it's about transformation of consciousness and experience. Once you get a taste for that, I was like, I, this is where it's at for me, you know? Mm. So I kept that there and I developed some skills around it, I think, learning those modalities. And it was in an ayahuasca context and actually in the context of my marriage. And this is one of the things I'm, you know, there's not a lot of like things about the marriage content wise that I'm grateful for mm. um, or that I feel warm and fuzzy thinking about. But mental chiropractic emerged from it because she and I were in Peru leading a workshop in the style of my father. Mm -hmm. Kind of at her, she was working down there at that time and she invited me down to lead with her. And I had also sort of apprenticed with my dad, but I refused to do things his way. I was going to do it my way, but I was still doing his thing, but I was doing it my way. Same thing with the psychology degree. I'll do it, I'll do your thing, but I'll do it my way and I'll do it better than you. Not a very autonomous, truly independent way of living. It's sort of, it's, a, it's the nearest available facsimile, facsimile for independence. So there we are in the jungle leading a workshop. And the woman I'm married to is leading very much in my dad's style, compassionate inquiry. I'm doing my own thing. And one participant said to me, you know, Daniel, you don't, work like your father does with people. I said, you're goddamn right. <laughs> he said, <laughs> he said, uh, yeah, you're just, you're just, it's, you, you, it's not that you're not compassionate, but you don't, just don't spend as much time hanging out with people's pain. You're like impatient. You want to get to, I'm like, yeah, but what is that? He said, you're a mental chiropractor. I said, yes, I am. Mm. That's exactly what I am. I love that. I'm getting in there. It's not long-term physiotherapy. It's come into the office. Where does it hurt? Yeah. What do you want? Mm -hmm. You know, and then let's show you where what you want is incompatible with the way you're looking at it. Yeah. I, I just love challenging people's point of view mm -hmm. <clears throat> to the point where their experience shifts. Yeah. Because I don't care whether you're right or wrong. I'm cared about the con I, I care about the consequences of your point of view. Mm -hmm. Your experience is completely, my experience is completely correlated with how I see things. Right. You know, and... 
of course, I'm not encouraging magical thinking or denial, like, or just block it out of your consciousness so you'll feel better, because that won't work long term. I'm talking about states like clarity and freedom and expansion and all the things we actually associate with healing. And this is the answer to the question, why are you healing? Because I want to be free, because I want to be myself. And how would you know if you're yourself? Well, I would be joyful, all that. Okay, great. Why don't we go straight for the joy, straight for the freedom? And the healing will happen as you experience these states. Do you feel like this is an addendum yeah. to therapy? Or do you feel like it's a replacement? It's Where, it's complementary, complementary. And, and you can do them in whatever proportion is right for you. Yeah. You know, I, I, I have done regular therapy. I don't know how regular it is right now for me, but it's been useful. It's a way of getting through life. I mean, it's a right. modern phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's a function. It it's a way of coping with the world we're living in, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing, I think, is not so much about that. It's closer to Socratic inquiry. It's closer to something yeah. human beings have always done, which is how can I align my consciousness? How can I align my mind mm. with my true intentions, with my values? And how can I allow my heart to be in the mix too yeah. without being driven by my feelings? Yeah. You know, so there, there's... There's a bit of, I mean, from having experiences, if there's a sense of a bit of like a mental, emotional coaching alongside um, an awareness. But like you said, we don't stay in that space for too long. It's like, right, okay, cool. And now what? Well, we all want to be seen and heard, right? Yeah. Ideally, the purpose of being seen and heard is, is, is so we can move on from whatever is being seen and heard. If we have to keep repeating it, what was the point in being heard? But I also want someone to be, in a sense, nailed. Like, because you want to see and hear yourself in a new way. Because mm -hmm. if, if, if all I want is to have my familiar, boring, disempowering story seen and heard, then it's a kind of collusion. And the collusion, the effect of the collusion, the net effect is to keep me stuck. Yeah, I mean, that is, that is something that I still try, I'm, I'm like trying to figure out a bit myself when it comes to therapy. Obviously, on the one hand, a very big advocate of it. I also do sometimes, I have this question mark around, and then? Mm -hmm. And to what end? Mm -hmm. And are we actually just feeding this sort of insatiable um, upset? Well, you tell me. You just had the experience. Yeah. And it is an experiential mm -hmm. modality. I don't yeah. allow people. People can take notes, but I don't recommend it. Mm -hmm. It's about experience. So what What was your experience? My experience is definitely one of great re relief. And mm -hmm. I do feel that there was... Uh, and relief was your intention. Relief was my intention. Absolutely. So, so it wasn't even like a random byproduct. We went for it. Yeah. And, and we, exactly. There was an intention... And when I compare that with maybe my experiences in therapy, I could I be could be discussing the same thing. There will be a sort of really, but it's not a relief. Really, it's a it's a it's a carrying. It's a holding. It's a very warm hug, <laughs> which there is also space for. I think there was definitely at a certain point in my life a need for that. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, I question sometimes when I'm like, am I just going back for more of the same? Well, more feelings. There's a kind of um hedonic treadmill of going back to the well for the same good feelings sometimes yeah. in therapy. Now, to the extent that therapy is about over the long term in a gentle way reprogramming the system to get used to being held mm -hmm. and seen mm -hmm. and understood and having the occasional aha insight and certainly discharging the stress of modern life, which includes isolation, pain, triggering, all that kind of stuff. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. But it's like getting a regular massage. It does feel a little bit like I'm not going to lie. There's nothing wrong with massage therapy. And what I, I call it <laughs> chiropractic. Now, I know chiropractic can be a controversial modality, but the idea of it at least is you get something into alignment and it stays in alignment yeah. so that you stop having the pain yeah. in this limb or, you know, in that muscle somewhere else. The whole system can function better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the strengths and the... I guess from a business model standpoint, kind of the potential shortcomings of the thing is I tell people, like, I'm not a therapist. I don't want to see you next week. Yeah. I'm not going to say, oh, well, we made some good progress. No, it's not incremental. Mm -hmm. If I have to see you next week, I fucked up. Mm -hmm. Or at least I didn't fulfill my intention because mm -hmm. that was to leave you with a sense of being unstuck. And if you're unstuck, then you should have new thoughts, new feelings, new choices, mm -hmm. a new experience for the next little while at least. Mm -hmm. So people can always come back and people do. 
So I'm not saying it's better than therapy, but I think if your intention is to get unstuck today, like to have an event, not a process, then it absolutely is better than therapy. Part of it is rebellion against my dad's patient, slow, compassionate inquiry into the pain of your childhood and how you developed all of your ailments. A kind of like, yeah, like, let's get on with it. Next. <laughs> and part of it is as a compliment to it because right. I see the value of that. Sure. And I bring both sides to, mm. to it. There's a kind of irreverence. There's also a kind of, you know, gentleness. So you've listed a few things that you've done on your healing journey, and I'm sure there are others. Um, you know, Landmark, those courses, ayahuasca, psychedelics, therapy. What for you has been the most transformational, um, if it, we can pinpoint one? And what of the practices... Um, do you still consistently practice to maintain good emotional and mental well-being? I mean, I would say the skills I learned in Landmark, not the infrastructure itself, because I'm no longer doing it and there's a lot of baggage with it that I think they could probably drop and, and still be as effective, if not more. But I internalized a lot of, again, it's about seeing things you can't unsee. Once I know that my story is giving me my experience, it's kind of game over for being the victim of anything. Because things are happening, and then my mind is making meaning out of it. The final frontier for me is the body. And maybe the final, final frontier is the spirit. Mm -hmm. I'm not a consciously spiritual person, although... I think I'm learning that I'm more spiritual than I thought and that even the work I'm describing, it's mental chiropractic, but we're marshalling very much the spirit. I mean, the spirit is okay. where intention really lies, I yeah. think, in many ways, yeah. um, or aspiration at least. So I, but the somatic stuff is something I'm only starting to bring in. I've mm -hmm. always been very resistant to it. I've always been very alienated from my body at the felt level. Mm -hmm in a lot of ways, um, at least in a spacious way, you know. And I still don't have like a meditation practice that's any with any regularity. I have done meditation retreats. They didn't really stick mm -hmm. uh, or I didn't stick to them. But, um, but, but doing somatic therapy, which is the domain I'm the worst at, that mm -hmm. I, I'm the least familiar with, that's where I need some hand-holding. That's where I need space held because I can't, always identify what the energy is or where I'm feeling right. in my body and having someone who's attuned to that helps extremely with that, you know, and it, it, it's transforming my experience of a lot of things right now. So that's an ongoing. That's process. interesting because, you know, obviously the myth of normal, uh, so much of it is talking about the mind body oh, yeah. connection. Um, and you, <laughs> that, but you're like, not necessarily, you're saying you're not, fully like you understand it intellectually but not necessarily em embodying it yourself yeah well i mean yeah. th that shouldn't be surprising to anyone <laughs> the author of in the realm of hungry ghosts <laughs> remains a workaholic right uh yeah people teach things all the time that they yeah, still yeah, need yeah. to learn yeah i mean that's been something incredible to hear both you and your father speak so openly about which is like being very open about being works in progress that you're Yes, you you write about this and speak about these topics, but that by no means puts you know means you're perfect or you've reached like nirvana enlightenment and and you you know you consistently both of you say that and I I really welcome that because I definitely and I know others have a hard time with feeling like we haven't reached it or oh my god we're still messing up and like i know this why did i still lose my shit the other day even though i'm supposed to know better and i should have done better and all of this and and there's it's really nice um to hear from people who are so um admired and respected in this particular space be like yeah it's always just a little incremental move yeah forward. and if we don't say it we certainly demonstrate it watch <laughs> us on stage together and you'll see that it's you know as far as the yeah. why did I do that, I mean, now I'll channel my dad. He, he's, this is a great observation. There's two ways to ask that question. Only one of them is a question. Mm. Why did I do that? It's not, why did I do that? It doesn't even <laughs> sound like a question. It's a statement. Mm. What's the statement behind? Why did I do that? 
I'm bad, I'm wrong, yeah. it's never going to work out, all of that. It's conclusions, it's completely declarative, actually, and mm -hmm. it, it's a decree. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, as opposed to, well, why did I do that? Yeah. What is up with me? <laughs> you know, yeah. what is my fucking problem? Like, you yeah. could phrase any of these things yeah. as curious questions that don't imply that there's anything wrong with having to ask it or with no, not knowing the answer. And yeah. any real question, if it's a question, the only thing it should provoke is at least a split second of silence mm -hmm. and space into, yeah. into which genuine insight can, mm -hmm. can flow. So, yeah. Myth of normal, um, hello again, uh, mental chiropractor. Um, and now, though, you've also entered another new domain, a very, very different domain to one that you <laughs> are perhaps used to. You'll explain to us a bit more. And that is entering the political arena, mm -hmm. the activist arena, and not just any arena, the uh, most volatile arena. Whatever could you be speaking about? <laughs> Hmm, what could we be talking about? So, yes, since October 7th or 8th, I suppose, is the day, right? October 8th, so the day after um, the infamous uh, attacks on October 7th, uh, you went online, you used your platform, uh, your large following, and you decided... Much less large, much less large at the time. Um, yes. Uh, and you decided to enter into an arena that a lot of people uh, are, are running far, far, far away from, and that's Israel-Palestine. Yeah. Why? Why did, you, why did you decide to put your head into the mouth of the lion? Yeah. Well, first of all, it was a return to something that I'd always cared about, but I had just kind of put aside. I, I went to a Zionist summer camp from age nine until age 17, and then, then I became a summer camp counselor there and then a program director. And yet I wasn't a fervent Zionist, but it was a context, it was a sort of social, socialist utopian atmosphere full of fellow Jews. And I had things in common with them. And it was a place where I could be friends with kids of all ages. It had a kind of hippie vibe. It was socially progressive in a lot of ways. And even within the Zionist framework, which has its hard limits, but we were pushing those limits. Mm. You know, we were debating whether Jerusalem should be a binational city. Um, we were um, we were talking about the occupation sometimes, depending on the counselors. And I had Israeli counselors, some of whom were very left wing, some of whom were fresh out of the army and basically just running Hasbara propaganda. And there was debate among the counselors. It was it was rich, you know. And on our Israel program, we lived on a kibbutz very close to Gaza. We'd see the Gazan farm workers coming in every day to the fields. I worked in irrigation. We never really spoke to them. I didn't understand much about their lives. And I I conveniently kept myself at some remove, but I was still reading Chomsky and I was reading mm. Edward Said, I think at the time. And I tried to organize a talk with, I forget who it was, someone from the Alternative Information Center in Jerusalem. And, you know, it was, I had to push against the the outer edges of the ideo ideological envelope of my context, but at least it had some room. Right. And towards the end of my tenure as a educator there, as a counselor, I ran a special day, a theme day of that seemed on this. It was kind of a Trojan horse because it was it, on the surface. It seemed like it was going to be a typical like Israeli Independence Day, like like we need to set up like settlements. And I mean, we literally called it settlements, you know, mm -hmm. the wall and tower and British mandate and like Arabs running around trying to kill us. But it was a bait and switch because in the middle of it, we get this like coded message about refugees and displacement or whatever. And we have to go decode it. And then we meet these people who are living in refugee camps just above the camp, above the summer camp. And we learned that like the kibbutz we've just founded is actually founded on the ruins of their village and now we have a decision to make and the, basically the choices we gave the kids about how to resolve this dilemma were analogous to all of the different available solutions one state two mm -hmm. states we pack up and fuck off and leave mm -hmm. they pack up and fuck off and leave um and the other things right and the kids in the end got to vote their conscience and actually, it was a split right down the middle of the camp, like literally 50-50 for one state versus two states, essentially. Interesting. And then we had discussions about it. Well, I think that was a pretty good use of a Zionist summer camp curriculum. 
And the Nakba was mentioned, the, okay. the word that dare not speak its name. And the Israeli counselors were kind of upset, and we raised the Israeli and Palestinian flag and sang a song about peace. That was as far as we could take it. This is my early 20s. And at that point, I was like, I'm tired of fighting this battle. Yeah. You know, I'm probably not a Zionist. I'm never going to be one. Let me mm -hmm. get out of the game. Mm -hmm. I got to McGill, joined some Israeli-Palestinian dialogue groups, learned the limits of that, mm -hmm. just learned how the kind of absurd power imbalance that had to be presumed to not be there in order to have these conversations and just what it was taking for the Palestinians to even speak to the Zionists among us. Then I left it aside and social media came along and now my activism consisted of every time Israel bombed Gaza, I would share articles other people didn't want to see and whatever. And then October 7th happened and I started seeing the gears of war, not the gears of war, the gears of massacre, uh, little did I know how bad it would be, but I knew it was going to be bad. I was actually watching a Christian Ambampur video on an uh, interview on CNN that next day. Um, and I mentioned her because just this morning I watched her interview the head of the IRC, the International Rescue Committee, for 11 minutes where he just lays out the stark reality of the famine. And she's still struggling to understand why would Israel and democracy do this? <laughs> but she at least is, in, it's, it's starting to penetrate, but it'll never penetrate completely because it can't because that would threaten her job. Oh, so it's like, it's like this mandated stupidity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I just got, I, I just, side note, like I was thinking of you and other Palestinians, like just how, the, the, how crazy making it would be to watch people be this obtuse. Yeah. I can't watch it. You know, stupid on purpose, basically. But anyway, at least, you know, now it's unavoidable. It's not stupid, though, but yeah. Right. <laughs> but it's, it, it is thick. Yes. A kind of thickness mm. and denseness. And, and in a certain level, it's conscious. and a certain level, it's just, it's just institutional. It's a stubborn superiority, I think. That's there, too. But, yeah. but with the pretense of either the pretense or the, or, the, or the limited presence of some compassion. But the compassion yeah. can only penetrate so far because, again, yeah. they don't have the intention of seeing the truth. No. Also, to, to actually see fully that truth would completely upend so much of their existence. That's exactly and, right. And, and I will get, yeah, I want to speak up to that, the psychology behind the strong attachment to a lie. 100%. <laughs> and what does that do? And like, can you mentally chiropract people out of this, please? Well, if I've been trying to do anything since October 8th, it's yeah. that, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. I've had extremely limited success, which is more success than mm. one might expect. Okay. I mean, what I'm saying is, it's very difficult to change people's minds on this, but the feedback I get is that I'm helping the people who do see it my way but don't but can't articulate it. Yeah. I'm helping clarify things for people who were on the fence and for many people on the other side of it. Sometimes I'm softening their position, sometimes I'm upsetting them to the point where they have to look at an alternative thing. Mm. So that is mental chiropractic in a sense. Mm. It's just kind of um, uh, not necessarily by request for it. It's an intervention. Yeah. You know? So just to go back, though, right. so you... So Christian Amanpour is yeah. interviewing yeah. some Palestinian guest, on, and she will not let him speak until he confesses his sins. And Do you condemn, condemn Hamas? Hamas and I just looked at that, and I was like, mm. somehow I'm built for this. Right. I'm agitated enough, but I'm also calm enough. Mm. I get why this is happening. Yesterday does not phase me. In mm. Like, it's not like a shock to my world that, I mean, it's amazing that it happened. Mm. And increasingly, as we learned about what took place on that day, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's inevitable. And I think I need people to understand why it's inevitable. Because if yeah. you don't understand why it's inevitable, you're going to be completely confused and you're going to much more likely be a, a, an unwitting accomplice to uh, the horrors that are coming. So I picked up my phone, went outside, and I started talking. I, Instagram live and I'd never really done that before. I found that people responded to it like water in the desert. And that surprised me. I didn't realize, mm -hmm. but I knew on some level that my amount of reading and understanding and thinking on this topic, my ability to articulate things with a kind of crystal clarity, my irreverent humor and ability to make points in a variety of ways, my compassion that is not indulgent, mm. 
mm-hmm. but it's kind of ruthless and takes the form of respecting people enough to tell them to their face that they're being fucking morons, mm-hmm. but without hating them for mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Like, let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. I'm not afraid. Yeah. I had nothing to lose. Mm. Well, I no. don't know. I mean, maybe. Some, some people would say you did. But... I'm not affiliated with any institutions except, ah, in that except, sense, yes. except Penguin Random House, who promised us when they signed us for the two books that they would stay out of our political work because we anticipated that something was going to happen at some point with Israel and we would end up speaking about it or at least my dad would. I I never had the notion that I would have such a platform but Mm -hmm. and they 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 gave us their word Mm -hmm. right and now a lot of people don't have that luxury Yeah. yeah you know so I don't have a job I could lose I'm not working at a university um so uh my indignation started growing and my wit kicked in and my, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever charisma I have talking to a camera or to, talking to my phone while I'm walking and, and just the feedback I was getting was so positive that I just kept going and yeah, I became sort of a combination analyst, satirist um, and, uh, and like it's the least, literally the least I can do and I'll go crazy if I don't. So yeah. I, just like I created mental chiropractic mainly because I enjoy it. In a big way, my at least my initial impulse to step out that day and, and record something was I gotta sort I gotta hear myself say this and I might as well open the window so other people can hear me talk to myself. And what has been the reception? How's the feedback, both positive and negative, been for you and impacted you? How do you process it? Because you've obviously grown a huge following as a result. Yeah. Blown up. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure there's also been a lot of unsavory (laughs) reactions. Not as much as you'd think. No? That's good. In fact, I would say I've gotten an almost equal amount of hate from um, Zionists Mm -hmm. as I have from um, certain factions of the pro-Palestine solidarity movement. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that all or even most of them are actual Palestinians, Mm -hmm. as often happens allies to a cause of marginalized people can be some of the most dogmatic, okay. <clears throat> rigid, and uh, fundamentalist yep. in not a good way. Yep. Uh, and so I've been accused of being a normalizer or defending mm. normalizers. Mm. Um, uh, or of centering myself or whatever, these mm-hmm. new, newfangled terms. You know, it's, I'm not cent- I'm, I'm speaking. You know, mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. fact that people put me at the center, yeah, it's unfortunate. Hopefully I can do something good there and bring other people closer to that spotlight, which, mm-hmm. as you said, I've been trying to do. And yeah, and then I've got Zionist troll, angry people calling me a kappa or a self-hating Jew or all these meaningless terms that are just basically them throwing a tantrum mm-hmm. because Israel's not going to get off the hook for this one. Nope. And they are flailing. So, so yeah, people cope by lashing out at me. Yeah. But the vast majority, uh, and it's been, this is the overwhelming thing, this is what I have a harder time with, is just the gratitude and the... Mm. The thanks, and I have a hard time with it, both because I've always had a look at me, look, don't look at me thing yeah. ever since I was a kid. I crave the attention, and I, I, sh- I don't want it. Right. It's, it, it inflames my ego. It does. Mm-hmm. It just does. Yeah. But at the same time, I can't get too self-absorbed or caught up in that either because that's what comes with attention. Yeah. And when people talk to me, they're like, no, that actually really helps yeah. because I don't feel crazy. Yeah. A lot of people... Their response is that my stuff, even when I'm being agitated, it regulates them. So mm-hmm. it's kind of homeopathic. Mm. And I'm speaking things that they are thinking but can't say yeah. or that they are feeling but can't think. Yeah. And that's a good role to play. And that that's is- me playing to my strengths and that's me using my time and my technology, I'd say, well. you know. Yeah. So then whatever the reaction is, I, I do have to filter out a lot of the sort of projection given what you know about psychology and trauma and healing how much do you see what is happening now within that lens and how much how helpful or not is it and how do you think one can exit this like psychosis yeah because it is it's like a form of and i know where it's coming from it's so much like unhealed and trauma and like that is 
that is relevant and that is understandable. And yet also like, obviously this is not the solution. Right. Well, I mean, and, and this is maybe where my mental chiropractic impatience comes in. Mm. I can have compassion for you, mm. but I'm not doing you any favors by condescending you, condescending to you and being like, oh, wow, it's just inevitable that you're going to stay here because of what happened to you. And maybe I could stand to be a little when I'm talking to certain Zionists, but you know what? I'm going to let my, I'm going to let my, I'm going to trust myself. Like, yeah, yeah. I can, what I listen for is the gaps, the cracks, the, the glitches in the matrix, the yes. places where I could okay. find a way in. And until I do, I'm actually not going to give an inch to people. I'm going to mm -hmm. actually frustrate their desire to engage on their terms because their terms are fucked. Mm -hmm. I'll talk to them, mm -hmm. but I, I call it jujitsu. <laughs> a kind of like, you know, first, now I'm here, now I'm not, you know, just go That's with, use, use their energy against them or judo, um, because, because they're, they're in a mania. It's true. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's reductive to say that it's all Holocaust trauma. It's clearly not, mm -hmm. because a big part of the Israeli right wing are not from the lineage of the Holocaust. They're Mizrahi. Mm -hmm. They have their own trauma. Yeah. I can have, the more I learn about that, the more compassion I have for that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, I'm not on the ground I think we have to be firing on all fronts. And this is where I, I, I object to a certain kind of puritanical impulse in the Palestine liberation movement, which presumes there's only one way to do it. Mm. You know, so people have concerns about normalization, mm -hmm. which is to say we shouldn't engage with Israelis, we shouldn't use the word Israel. It's mm. the crumbling Zionist settler colony. Very catchy, you know, like put that into a, a slogan. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah. Valid. But and what I'm saying, but what, what what bothers me is when people come up in my DMs or my comment threads, being like, "You had a, a D, you had a Instagram live with an Israeli," yeah. or if someone told you you're friends with someone who was born in Israel, yeah, you know, you're undermining the movement. And I saw the the way that standing together was taken down in that BDS mm -hmm. statement, and like I can get the criticism of standing together. There's something about them that like. I get impatient with yeah. and that I worry about. Mm -hmm. And he's saying that within Israel, the only thing Israelis listen to is self-interest. Right. And if the point is ceasefire, if the point is get the aid in, then, and we have, and it's a group of Jews and Palestinians, all citizens of Israel, trying to talk sense to their own country. Who am I to tell them that they're undermining the movement? No, what you're saying then is it's not your style. Okay, it's not your style. Like, it takes all kinds. It's, it's a big buffet, and we need pressure from inside, pressure from outside, and depending on the audience, you're going to have different tactics. So yeah. I, is it possible? I hope so, but yeah. in the meantime, we've got to try. Recently, someone said to me, you know, um, for people in the region, they look at the diaspora folk, as quite militant, uh -huh. and they're like, you're not helping us out with your militant, militancy. Well, mili but militant, and but militant with with nothing to lose, with nothing which to is lose. not real militancy. A, and militant and out to lunch. And I've heard Palestinians on the ground call it this way. It's like you're up in the stands watching the sports game, and yeah. you're like waving the flag. We're yeah. fucking down here down playing, here, and so we should be listening and directing them to that. And to that point, I think was and my ability to hold that space more and actually open up to more voices was a lot down to me doing the personal work interesting for myself yeah and i touched on this with the conversation i had with hadar in the last episode where you know being wary of projecting your own unhealed issues onto a cause which is also a very common thing to activists very do. important and that i would just kind of almost as like a final note to just have that in your mind's eye when you're being very, very passionate, but also immovable on a point, like how much is it about the point and how much is it about something that's within you that isn't really being addressed and adequately um, healed? Them. Look, so, I, yeah, I have to deal with the same thing in myself. It's a little different. It's not so much my militancy. It's my ego. <laughs> it's my self-regard. It's my, sometimes my harshness. Mm. my ego can get in there and, and, and I can be doing things just for the wrong reasons. Mm. And that's me projecting my own shit because why would I do that? Because I don't feel enough in some way. 
So I'm getting a hit off of, and now I'm, you know, deriving a kind of fringe benefit from this, which incentivizes it to continue for me. Like, what if the genocide ended? Well, how would I get? This is kind of a very dark thought, but like, what would you do? Who, who would? Be plenty of work. What, what would I do for praise? You know? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I just need to watch out for that mm. that tendency. Mm. Um, yeah, it's just something to be conscious of, right? It's and that's right. Maybe there are layers to the work that needs to be done. Mm-hmm. But thank you so much, Daniel, for spending this period of time speaking with me about so many different topics, delving into your childhood, your adulthood, all of the processes that you've been through. Thank yeah. you also for the mental chiropractic work that you did on me. That was really wonderful. Thank you for having me. It's a real, real pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode. Check out the show notes for more details about my wonderful guests, including where you can find them on social media. If you enjoyed listening to this, please do spread the good word, share with friends, family, cousins, and colleagues, and please, please, please like and leave a review on whatever platform you are listening to this podcast. Your support is crucial for the show's success, and a couple of clicks from you will mean the world to me. Go to my website, leilamagrabi.com, and follow me on Instagram and Twitter for more news on future episodes.